please welcome Jason Marsak of the Atlantic Council and our esteemed panel. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. We're in Miami. We're also in Miami, so we decided this is a no tie panel uh, because we're here in Miami. So great to follow the center, great to be here at Concordia. Uh, what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes is tease out new insight on what needs to be done to accelerate nearshoring from rhetoric into reality. And we have four excellent speakers to do so. To my left is Costa Rica's Minister of Foreign Trade, Manuel Tovar, uh, who also was a representative and head of the Costa Rican delegation to the OECD. Great to have you here, Minister. Guatemala's Minister of Economy, Janiel Rosades, uh, who also brings more than 20 years of experience in multinational companies. Mor Morgan Ortegas, great to have you as well, Morgan. Uh, the founder of Polaris National Security, a former State Department spokesperson. And I'll also add to your bio, a former Atlantic Council senior advisor. And then also Kareem Lasima, Kareem Executive Vice President and Chief External Affairs Officer for Millicom, uh, and I was uh, one of the most important foreign investors uh, in Central America. I'm going to start off with a little bit of context before we jump into questions. Some context. The IDB estimates show that nearshoring could add an annual $78, $78 billion in additional exports of goods and services in Latin America and the Caribbean with quick wins into multiple sectors. So, of course, nearshoring represents a major opportunity for Latin America and the Caribbean, but translating nearshoring from rhetoric into reality is challenging, including in quick wins. So how can we create success stories, including in Central America? I'm going to lay out quickly three sets of, con of conditions before we, I jump into our questions here. One is, I think it's important to look at the combination of international push factors and domestic pull factors that can accelerate nearshoring. International push factors, pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ESG requirements, US policy, but also domestic pull factors, domestic economic competitiveness, macroeconomic stability, education, skills, rule of law, physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, of course, Kareem, but also a combination of the public sector and the private sector working together to get it right. Governments can't do it alone. We need leadership from the private sector. And three, short-term results but also having a long-term vision because of course any business doesn't invest without looking into the, into the long term. So what's the nearshoring state of play? What more needs to happen to capture this opportunity? And how do we do so so the benefits are felt across society? Mr. Tavar, let me start with you. We're, are you seeing a rapid acceleration of nearshoring trends? Are, we, are you seeing from, in Costa Rica this, this boom that we're talking about? Uh, thank you, Jason, and I'm happy to be here with uh, friends and, and, and partners. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a moment of opportunity for, for Latin America. We have to seize the opportunity. The COVID-19 pandemic, the brutal aggression of uh, Russia in Ukraine, and of course, the you know, increasing tensions in, in, in the Asian uh, region have uh, brought Latin America to the landscape. And this is a moment that we have to seize. And certainly, you know, we've seen in Mexico, we've seen uh, you know, the announcement of, of Tesla, in Mexico recently, we, in Costa Rica, we have had important uh, reinvestments and uh, some other greenfield investments in medical devices and, and semiconductors, which prove that this is the moment for us. But in order to seize the opportunity again, you mentioned long term. And we do have to certainly uh, make and adopt all the public policies necessary to attract this sort of investment, but look into the long term, because yeah. we want them to, to arrive, but we want them to stay. So I want to talk about those public policies. Mr. Rosales, from Guatemala's perspective, are you, do you believe that nearshoring is rapidly accelerating, and, and what do you see as needing to happen to, to do so? Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. I actually agree totally with uh, Minister uh, Tovar. Uh, regarding the, the, the world juncture uh, and the crisis of global chains, um, we see a great opportunity for Central America uh, and, and also Mexico to bring this near shoring uh, strategy uh, into a new fulfillment of improvement of how can you know, not only generate more uh, businesses, but also you know, uh, the, the employment for the next two or three years. So as uh, Guatemala, we are uh, working within the Minister of Economy, uh, establishing different actions. For instance, uh, we created a private sector and public sector Guatemala Moving Forward Plan, which is focusing on part of the agenda of near shoring, specifically in, in terms of infrastructure. We also have a new joint agreement with the uh, Department of State 
for the next uh, two or three years. So this, the goal is to improve, uh, not only to attract more, more FDI investment, but uh, to build uh, walls of prosperity. So we, we now know, for instance, that it also can help stop the irregular migration. And also nearshoring can help uh, the economy to be more resilient. So at the end of the day, we think that working within this type of alliances and, and, and talking about it you know, in these public spaces is going yeah. to be crucial for the, for the next year for Central America. So Mr. Rosales, I want to get, get back to, we'll go back in a moment to the uh, agreement with the Department of State and also some of the new legislation in Guatemala. Yeah. We'll talk about Costa Rica as well. But let me first go to, go to you, Morgan, um, uh, at Polaris. And before that, you focus on U.S. national security threats. Um, from your perspective, what more needs to be done at a U.S. policy level to kickstart a serious long-term focus and also show the fact that nearshoring isn't just a thing that's nice to do, but how it's in the strategic U.S. economic interest to, to be able to do so? Yeah, well, first of all, Buenos Dias, it's so good to be back at Concordia. And thank you to Matt Swift. He puts together these panels that you really don't find anywhere else. And it's such an honor to be with both of you on stage. I visited your countries with Mike Pompeo and know how important the relationship continues to be uh, to both Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, I, I sort of want to frame this discussion in both the national security, American national security, and the political lens, because I think it's really important to be cognizant um, and to be realistic about where the political winds are in the United States, especially as President Biden just unveiled his budget yesterday in Philadelphia. And, and this is a trend going back to the 2016 elections when um, actually for Fox News, I covered both the Republican and Democratic conventions and there was anti-TPP signs in both conventions, right? So you have the two parties uh, converging on this sense of needing to bring American supply chains home. Uh, there is a very real fear, as you can see from the Bipartisan China Committee in the House, there is a very real f uh, fear about the rising um, potential of conflict with China. So I think from American lawmakers' perspective uh, and from a national security perspective, um, uh, uh, it's going to be important for American companies to first bring jobs home within our borders, and then second to the Americas um, and to all of your countries. And so I think that that will be the focus. I think if you're interested in in, in what American policymakers care about on both sides of the aisle, uh, it's going to be not to work with companies or countries that are overly dependent on China. I think that's going to be the first priority. And while American lawmakers are most likely going to want you to bring American, uh, going to want you to bring manufacturing and other jobs home on our soil, if there's a, the ability to nearshore them as opposed to having them in countries like Russia or China that are adversarial to the United States, uh, that's going to be the first and the highest priority. So I, I think it's important to set that political context um, that we're all living in, that, that American lawmakers on both sides of the aisle do want to do want these American companies to bring jobs home, um, but nearshoring is a second very high priority you as know, well. You know, as you're saying, Morgan, it's, it's probably one of those few areas where there's actually bipartisan consensus yeah. in Washington where we talk, we talk about true. nearshoring, right? Uh, and it's a matter of how do we take that bipartisan consensus and actually make make it actually a reality, right, beyond beyond just the, the, the rhetoric. I want to go back to the politics later, but Kareem, let me bring you in. Um, nearshoring can take a lot of different uh, 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 forms and shapes, uh, but private sector commitment and private sector investment is absolutely fundamental. Uh, companies like Millicon uh, have decided to invest uh, in the nearshoring ecosystem. Near Millicon has committed uh, hundreds of millions of dollars through the partnership uh, through the PCA um, to the Northern Central America. What policy reforms from the private sector perspective need to be taken at the national and international levels to really accelerate nearshoring to, to make it a long-term proposition? Look, I, th I think I totally support the comments of uh, our three speakers. And the reality is we have to look at the market like at the strategic value, right? We are thinking to uh, near shore or take back some jobs from China and et cetera. And if we want to really convince Central America, we need to look at them as partners. Mm -hmm. You know, this needs to be a win-win for the two sides. It cannot be uh, Central America or Latin America will, is going to do exactly what the U.S. wants. You know, politically, you need to convince. You need to create opportunities. You need to look at the markets in a very open way. Uh, meaning it's not only putting some jobs into uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Panama. It's creating opportunities also for them to have access to the U.S. market. We need really to think to this as an uh, extended USMCA. Mm -hmm. You know, if we really want this to work, in my opinion, and this will create those opportunities, grow the cake, and allow everybody to really create a new model. 
Uh, immigration is a big issue in DC, but you know, if we want to convince people uh, not immigrate, we need to give the opportunity, for example, for companies in our region, uh, to, uh, so in Central America, in Latin America, to have access to US market. We're having that discussion yesterday night, very interesting, that uh, the US often asks people to avoid uh, using Chinese uh, products and et cetera, but uh, nobody can really export their meat, for example, for specific countries into the US market. And these are very tough discussions in the US, but we will need to have them if we really want to create this uh, new nearshoring approach or this new strategic uh, partnership with Central America and then the rest of the region. And we should not take for granted the support of local uh, people in the, in the region. We should, not imagine, we should not be sure that uh, people will automatically love the US. We need to gain that confidence uh, of those people. It needs to be a win-win. If yeah. not, we are starting on the wrong foot. And we, got, we have to make sure, as you're saying, that the nearshoring opportunities are, are felt, the benefits are felt across societies. And that it's a two-way it's a two-way two discussion. It's a two-way two -way dialogue. Mr. Tavar, let me come back to you. Uh, uh, for the past two de decades, Costa Rica has attracted significant uh, foreign uh, direct investment, helping to build a uh, well-known knowledge-based economy. Uh, the IDB report shows that Costa Rica could be actually be number seven in the entire region that could benefit potentially from nearshoring. What additional steps are you looking at to be able to attract policy reforms that you could, to attract uh, uh, foreign investment into Costa Rica at this incredible moment? Uh, I think, frankly, frankly, a generational moment to be able to bring new investment in, into Central America. First of all, we need to reform. Uh, our commitment to institutions, to good governance, to democracy, human rights, sustainable development. That is the essence of Costa Rica. And we cannot uh, afford to you know, set back from, from that uh, landscape that we have uh, you know, paved, uh, th this road that we have paved along the way. But also we have come up with, under uh, the President Chavez, with a very strong, ambitious trade agenda, opening up more to the world, having more of Costa Rica in the world, uh, reaching out other markets uh, like Middle East, the Gulf countries, and of course Israel. Uh, we have sought to join the Pacific Alliance. Unfortunately, there's some political disruption there between some of the partners. Uh, we have just signed a free trade agreement with Ecuador, and uh, we want more. We have uh, also uh, sought to join the CPTPP. So uh, we have to renew, uh, reaffirm our vows to open trade, because open trade at the end of the day spurs uh, foreign direct investment. And I would say also human talent, invest in human talent, invest in innovation. If we want to make that leap into development, into that sort of development that the region Long, so long needs, we have to invest in innovation, and that's an area where Latin America still, you know, is lagging behind. Right. You need, you need, you need the workforce to be able to attract the companies to, to, to come. Um, Mr. Rosales, you were mentioning beforehand yeah. the agreement with the State Department yeah. as well. Uh, Guatemala in September came into force, the new uh, Act for Promotion of Investment of Foreign Capital. So a number of different steps that are yeah. being taken by the Guatemalan government. Love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, regarding nearshoring, we actually have like five steps that we have been working on. The first one is an investment strategy uh, for attracting FDI. That also have been working with the USAID project, creating economic opportunities. Also, uh, this uh, start of the supply chain uh, dialogue mechanism started uh, on February, and we already identified at least $400 million for U.S. enterprises to benefit also for, for this in Guatemala. Uh, the coordination of the Guatemala Moving Forward Plan, that is an interinstitutional uh, investment attraction with public and private sectors included. And also uh, another type of business-friendly legislative agenda. For instance, we passed the foreign investment law for FDI. This will guarantee the in income tax conditions under which the firm uh, build its projects for the next 10 years, also an anti-red tape law. And also we reaffirm uh, that we are uh, allies of the United States. We work within the ABC, anything but China, and we are really committed to that. <laughs> so th but that's, that's, the, that's the beauty about the economics. I thought my ABC is a little bit different yeah. back then, but so, it has changed. So economy is rational, and we are being rational about that. We want uh, the zone that is nearest to us from two hours to give us heat instead of a 12-hour heat that is not going to give us more than, than cold. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing that I totally agree with, uh, Karim, we should work as allies. Yeah. You know, you, if, if the United States really wants to gain, again, the leadership in the region, uh, they should 
uh, CEOs as allies. And another thing, we want trade, not, not aid. So let's work within this framework. Let's work within uh, the countries that uh, we are we're working greatly, for instance, with uh, uh, Minister Tovar and uh, in the integration of Central America. So at the end of the day, we are going to have also prosperity and we are going to have uh, people that want to stay in their country and not yeah. generating problems elsewhere. Yeah. So Morgan, Mr. Rosales, Mr. Tovar, talking about a number of different steps that both of their countries are, are taking mm -hmm. and other countries are taking steps as well. Uh, from the from the from the uh, the poll side, but from the push side, from the U.S. side, insofar as incentivizing greater nearshoring, do you think the politics? We, you talked before about bipartisan consensus. However, do you think the politics actually lined up to actually move forward action? Uh, Senator Cassidy has an America's Act. There's other bills that are out there. That's uh, with uh, Congressman Salazar as well. Are the politics actually lined up, especially as we're heading into an election year next year, mm -hmm. to be able to have uh, real reform efforts taken from a legislative perspective? This year, 23, is probably the year to get anything done uh, from a legislative perspective because a year from now we're going to know who the Republican and Democratic nominees are, assuming President Biden is going to run again. And, and once you get into that season, it just sort of turns into silly season um, in the United States. So I, I do think this is the year to get done, but, uh, but I, I would say that I think the administration and especially the State Department and my former colleagues there need to lead more on this issue. Um, at the time, whenever I was working for Pompeo, um, it, it, it didn't get a ton of national coverage because there was always so much going on in the news in the Trump administration, but I think Pompeo went to the Western Hemisphere more than any other modern Secretary of State. We were trying to count up all the trips and make sure we had that those statistics um, right. It was incredibly important to them. And I think one of the unfortunate things about the failure of deterrence um, when Russia invaded Ukraine is how it has sucked up all the oxygen out of the room from a foreign policy perspective for this administration um, to be able to focus on other regions. So uh, I know um, Senator Menendez um, uh, and others are incredibly focused on this region and will be making uh, visits and trips there. Um, and I would encourage the Biden administration and the Blinken State Department to double down on their focus and on their commitment to the Western Hemisphere because there's different pieces of legislation that you referenced that could get through, but none of this is going to be passed if there's not top-down push from the administration to make a renewed focus, a real focus. I think even the Democratic mayor of New York City said uh, somebody needs to be focused on this on a daily basis, not a side job. Uh, this should be, uh, from the top of the administration, should be focused on our relationship, as Kareem mm -hmm. said, as partners in the Western Hemisphere. And there's been a number of congressional delegations that continue yeah. to mm -hmm. come down to the region. Important for those delegations to look at nearshoring opportunities as, as part of that work. Uh, Kareem, uh, you and I have spoken at length about the importance uh, of, of working together, and I'm excited that the uh, Atlantic Council will be starting a nearshoring working group uh, working with uh, Myth Millicom as part of that. Uh, Kareem, from Millicom's perspective, why, why is that so important to be able to accelerate nearshoring to this, uh, at, this, at this critical moment? Look, my father teach me two things. One of those is never cry. Okay, never <laughs> complain, you know, you should never complain, you should try to find a solution. And I think uh, most of the time or too much industry cry or complain and go to see the government to try to ask for a solution. And I think we need to revert this. I think we need to take the lead, we need to help uh, in our region but also in the U.S. to try to convince why it's important for the U.S. and for Central America uh, to really push forward this. Like it happened with USMCA. This is not only about security, this is not only about immigration, it is about economic opportunities, it is about creating wealth, it is creating an alternative to the existing supply chain in order for the next crisis, because unfortunately we know the next crisis will come. So look, what we, have, what we are starting with uh, the Atlantic Council is super important, but the idea is really to do something multi-sector, multi-party, and to work together. So whoever wants to join us, please do, because what I'm fed up and I'm listening to the words of my father is really we should not ask politicians or governments to try to solve all the problems. We should take it, lead it, put the money that we need to put in order to support those, and those efforts and really start looking peacefully at the situation. Hanyo was talking about this fantastic project that is uh, Guatemala no se detiene, that is uh, really a PPP that has been done where uh, Guatemala business worked in order to try to show why Guatemala was so much a success. And I think this is what we need to do because most of the time people don't see that the most stable currency in the region is the Quetzal. And you know, who knows that there's a Quetzal? 
And those are one of the reasons why you want to go there. So let's try to do it all together, guys. And let's try to really to work on this to push it politically, but also economically. Uh, we have just a few seconds left. What haven't we spoken about that needs to happen to accelerate nearshoring? Well, I would say that uh, still we see many, many challenges in terms of governance, as I mentioned, and the rule of law. International investors and companies, they need to feel safe where they put their money. And this is something where we have seen a regression in Latin America. So I think we have to work on that. Fantastic. Well, we'll end on that. Thank you, Mr. Tovar, for that uh, last comment. Mr. R Tovar, Mr. Rosales, Morgan, Kareem, uh, fantastic to have you be a part of this panel. Thank you again for Concordia for uh, having this panel on nearshoring. It's it, what I say is a generational moment to be able to accelerate investment into Latin America, the Caribbean, and Central America specifically.